Good morning. Want to welcome you to this service of worship this morning. It's so nice to see all of you here. But if this is your first time to worship with us, then we're especially glad that you are here. I would invite you, you should have a worship registration pad at the end of your pew. If you would take that and fill it out and send it to your neighbors, we would appreciate that. And while you're doing that, let me just give you a moment to say hello to those who are seated around you. Say um, a word of welcome to them, if you would, please. I hope everybody got a nice warm welcome. That was short, but uh, I would ask if you would pick up your bulletins now. There are several announcements that I would like to cover with you or highlight this morning. There's information in there, a whole page of information about our long-term study groups. You can also pick up this brochure in our Welcome Center this morning. Those groups, all but one, begin in September. So many of you express an interest in these ongoing and, and in-depth Bible studies, and these are some of the best studies that are offered. Just this last year, we've had 200 people enrolled in Disciple Bible Study type of classes. And I continue here about the life-changing relationships and the nurturing and inspiration that happens in these classes. Uh, just speaking personally, when I first started in Disciple Bible Study, I thought I was way too busy and did not have time for this in my life. And 18 years later, I wouldn't miss having this as a part of my life. It's one of the primary ways in which I receive inspiration. So I'd invite you to seriously consider enrolling in one of these Bible studies this year. And you can do that in the Welcome Center and then also the Education Office. Today, our youth are heading out to Lyle Lodge for their back to school bash. They'll be gathering at the Justin Building at 3 o'clock this afternoon. If you have a youth or you are a youth and you're not registered for that, it's not too late. Just check in with Reverend Graff or Reverend Bellamy after the service. You'll also notice announcements there about acolyte training. Um, today is Mission Sunday, but it's not too late to bring those items during the week. There's a special youth, uh, young adult program on Friday night and then other announcements and programs and ministries happening throughout the church that I hope you will make note of these programs as you seek to be nurtured in your own faith, that each one of us might go out to be God's people in the world. And now let our worship begin as we hear these words. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. Hi, I'm Tim Brewster, Senior Pastor of First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. Welcome to this service of worship. I'm glad you've chosen to join us in this broadcast of our 11 o'clock worship service. And I hope you can join us in person at one of our services at 8.30 in the chapel, 9.30 in the sanctuary, 11 o'clock in the sanctuary, and at 11.11 in Wesley Hall. On behalf of the whole congregation of First United Methodist Church, I welcome you.
Please be seated. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. from the book of Luke, chapter 11, verses 29 through 32. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so the, man, so the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them, because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon and see something greater than Solomon is here. The people of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah and see something greater than Jonah is here. God speaks to us through the reading of the scripture. God. Hmm. 
I'd like to invite the uh, children to come forward and join me here at the front for our time together. Good morning. Are you there? Good morning. Good morning. Hey, there you go. One of you is awake anyway. Hey, uh, do you know the story of Jonah? Does anybody know the story of Jonah? Yeah, a couple of you do. There was a man named Jonah, and God wanted him to go to a big city called Nineveh to uh, preach to that city, to teach him about God. And... But what did he do? He didn't want to go. So he got on a boat going in the opposite direction. And a big storm came up. He ended up overboard. And what happened to him? He got bit, What? He got eaten by a big fish. Yeah, he got swallowed by a big fish, right? And what happened to him then? He didn't get eaten. No, he didn't get eaten. That's true. He, well, he got out. Yeah, the big fish spit him out. Right? Because he Just, tasted bad. Because he tasted bad? Yeah. yeah. I bet he did. Yeah. My dad better well, not show that to my grandma. Well, he, uh, uh, he was there for how, how long? How long was he in the belly of the fish? Do you remember? Three days. Three days. Right. He was. And then he got spit out up on the shore for whatever reason. Maybe he didn't taste good. And uh, then he decided to listen to God, right, after that? And he went to Nineveh, and he talked to them about all the stuff they were doing wrong. And what did they do? They changed, didn't they? And they stopped doing all the bad stuff to each other and to other people, and God forgave them. And... Uh, they became different people because of God's love and forgiveness. Well, that's a great, great story because it tells us, first of all, about doing what God asks us to do and the great things that happen when we do. When God asks us to share God's love with others, then other people respond to that, don't they? Yeah, and they become more loving themselves. And we also learn about God's love and God's forgiveness. So, did you have something to add? I um, pray for God. I pray. Good. I'm glad you pray. That's good. Why don't we do that right now? We'll pray. And you all repeat after me, and, and we'll pray together that way. Oh, God. Oh, God. We thank you. We thank you. For the story of Jonah. For the story of Jonah. We pray. We pray. That you would help us. You would help us. To do what you ask us and that we would love others and tell others about your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you all. Have a good day.
Creator God, breath of the universe and heartbeat of the earth, you are our beginning, our end, and our in-between. You are our salvation, not only on this day, but on every day. You are our deliverance, not only for ourselves, but for our neighbors. Oh God, we need you. We are frail, but your strength makes us strong in our frailty. We are foolish, but your wisdom makes us wise in our folly. We are vain, but your humility makes us humble in our vanity. Your life in us makes us more and better than we are. For this we praise you, not that you stoop to us, but that you lift us up. Not that you condescend to care for us, but that you elevate us to care for one another. We come today to receive the cup and the loaf of bread. O oh Lord, enliven our souls that we might follow your way. Enlighten our minds that we might understand your truth and empower our spirit that we might embody your life. For the way of the cup and the loaf is within us. You have written it upon our hearts. And the truth of the cup and the loaf is that you shall be our God and we shall be your people. And the life of the cup and the loaf is knowing you. Make our hearts burn within us, O God. In our communion, transform us. Make us a parable of the kingdom and a sign unto the world. Be with us now as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. <laughs> our heavenly Father up in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Our Old Testament lesson this morning is a reading from Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed in God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God speaks to us through the reading of scriptures. Thanks be to God. And as we are gathering for the Lord's Supper, for communion together, uh, let me remind you that uh, everyone's invited to the table. Uh, if you're visiting with us today and you are not uh, a United Methodist, please know that you're invited. This is an open table. It is the Lord's table, not the Methodist table. Everyone is, is welcome.
today, I want us to think about our notion of God. And what has shaped that notion of God and the effect that that has in our own spiritual lives. If you go back to the very earliest days of the Christian church, you find that there is a persistent notion of God that is God is unmoved and unchanging and unchangeable and unmovable. A notion that comes right out of Greek philosophy that God is static being, unchanged, unchangeable. As that notion developed through the centuries, the image of God as a great watchmaker, that same sort of notion, God created everything, set it up like a watchmaker would, started it running and then went off someplace to watch as it winds down. That notion of God as somehow distant, that you see persistently spoken about, you see people sing about it. Uh, a few years ago, we had, it was a wonderful song in so many ways, God is watching us from a distance. That notion of the distance of God and the un, or the non-involvement of God seems persistent. And those who see God as this kind of static being, this unmoved mover, the one who just is like a rock, would read that image in the psalmist, God is my rock, and they would say, yeah, that's pretty much it, a rock. Permanent, immovable, doesn't act, doesn't change, a rock. But of course, the psalmist didn't have that in mind at all, and when we carefully read the scriptures, we find a completely different image of God. And we see it in a dramatic way in the story of Jonah. You heard the story a moment ago as I recounted it with the children. Uh, this reluctant prophet, as he is nicknamed, one who did not want to go to the wicked city of Nineveh because we assume he doesn't want to go because the city of Nineveh is uh, a terrible place. It's, uh, the people of Nineveh are cruel. Uh, it is an enemy to Israel. Who would want to go to Nineveh to preach to those folks and to tell them that God will bring calamity upon them and to give them a chance to, to change. Certainly not Jonah. And so Jonah goes down to Joppa, catches a boat to Tarshish, the very opposite direction from Nineveh. And he ends up in the belly of the fish and he is vomited up onto the shore, the text says. And then he's ready to listen after that ordeal, and he goes to Nineveh right into the heart of that huge city, three days to walk across that city, it's so large. And he, his message to the Ninevites is, in 40 days, God is going to destroy you. Now you can imagine, as much as Jonah did not want to go, as much as he hated the Ninevites, that when he finally did get there, he must have enjoyed delivering that message. God's going to get you. And so he walked uh, through the city delivering that message. And then an amazing thing happened. The people put on sackcloth and ashes, a symbol of penitence and repentance, and they, they changed. They actually changed their lives. They repented. They turned around. So what do we learn from the story of Jonah. Well, we've learned one thing this morning already, and that is reluctant prophets don't taste good to fish. <laughs> but more than that, in the 10th verse of the third chapter is this statement about God. When God saw what they did, how they turned away from their evil ways, God changed his mind and did not bring about the calamity that he had planned. Interesting. God changed his mind. It may be a surprising sentence if 
You read the, those words and you're operating under the assumption that God is unchanged, unchangeable, the unmoved mover, the watchmaker that sits at a distance and watches it all. God changed his mind. It's not the only time we read that in Scripture. We see a dramatic instance of that in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, these two wicked cities. God plans to destroy them because of their wickedness. And, and uh, Abraham intercedes on behalf of the cities. And he says to God, God, what if we can find 50 righteous people in the city? Surely we can find 50 righteous. Would you spare the city for the sake of the 50? Surely, God, you would not destroy the city if there were 50 righteous there. And God says, okay, for 50, I will spare it. And Abraham says, well, Lord, I don't want you to be angry, and I know I'm being presumptuous here, but what if we get close? What if we're short five people? Surely you would spare the city for 45. Okay, for the sake of 45. Lord, I don't mean to press the issue, but what if we can find 40, okay, for the sake of 40? And then it's 30, and then it's 20, and then it's 10. It's a remarkable text. And each time, like an auctioneer working kind of in reverse, Abraham is able to get God to agree to lower and lower numbers. Each time, God changes his mind. Six times, as a matter of fact, in that text. And always in the direction of grace and forgiveness and a different future. Now, of course, we know in that story they can't find ten. And so the ending is not good for those cities. But over and over again, we see God in dynamic relationship with people. And I believe that's one of the primary issues in this story. That God is not off in the distance someplace, uninvolved in the lives of people, but God is in dynamic relationship with us, at work in us and through us, in ways that go beyond our comprehension. And so the response of the people in Nineveh is repentance, a change of their lives. Frederick Buechner says of repentance that it is a change in direction. But he also says it is not so much a matter of looking in the past and saying over and over again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But it is more about looking to the future and saying, wow. And I like his notion of repentance. That as the people make the decision to change, that they have this new future that they can look toward and say, wow. Phyllis Tribble, the biblical scholar in, her, in the New Interpreter's Bible and her commentary on this, on this text, says that Jonah is one of many stories found throughout Scripture that have to do with the dynamic relationship between the divine and the human, between God and people, and that often those stories are open-ended. We see it in Jonah. Because at the end of the story, the fourth chapter of Jonah, we find Jonah sulking off by himself. Interesting response to what has happened to him. He goes out of the city and he sulks. He's sulking because he went out of the city, the text says, to wait and see what would happen. You can imagine the countdown to the 40th day. Zero hour. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. One, and nothing happens. And Jonah, who was hoping, obviously, hoping for his enemies to be destroyed, hoping God would give these folks what they deserved, was deeply disappointed. And in fact, he was angry. And God sees him sulking and angry and does an interesting thing. He causes this bush to grow up, the text says, 
and shade Jonah, and Jonah enjoys this cool shade in the heat of the day, and then God sends worms to attack the bush, and, and it shrivels and dies, and the next day Jonah is baking in the sun like a August day in Fort Worth. And he's angry. And the Lord says, Jonah, are you angry? And he's very childish in his response. I'm so angry, I, I just want to die. Okay, God says in so many words. Let's look at this. Jonah, you're upset because this bush has died, a bush you had nothing to do with planting. And you're uncomfortable. And do you question me because I care about that great city with 120,000 people and animals besides? You're worried about a bush when all these folks have turned and have been saved. Jonah never answers. The story ends with that open-ended kind of ending. And Tribble says it's open-ended because we write the endings of those stories. It's like the prodigal son. The prodigal son, you remember the, the younger son goes and squanders his inheritance and the father welcomes him back, not only with open arms, but welcomes him back with a party. And the older brother is furious. And the story ends with the older brother refusing to join the party, leaving us to wonder, does he ever come around? Does he ever change? Does he ever move in the direction of grace? Is the relationship with God and with his brother and with his father dynamic, living? Is Jonah's relationship with God and with others dynamic and living? Or is it sort of dead like a rock? The concern about people viewing God as unmoved and unmoving and as distant, a solid rock someplace that is unresponsive, is what that can do over time to the relationship. How many of you remember pet rocks? Raise your hand. Remember pet rocks? If, if, if you're below a certain age, I don't know. It's hard to explain pet rocks, really. It, a product of the 1970s, and there's so much about that decade that's difficult to explain. But <laughs> some guy took a rock, and he put it in a box with holes in it, called it a pet rock on, you know, sort of Easter basket grass, and he sold these things by the millions. People bought them. This indeed is the land of opportunity. Who could argue with that? <laughs> And he made piles of money off that. Now let me ask a more pointed question. How many of you owned a pet rock? Oh, come on. I don't, I don't believe it. I, I'm admitting to it. I had a pet. How many of you owned a pet rock? Unbelievable. I, there are a few. There are a few. Those of you who raised your hand, how many of you had such a deep, lasting relationship with your pet rock that you still have it? There, there is one. It may be worth something now, actually. I don't know. We had someone in the first service that still has a pet rock, too. I was... Well, most people, I think, have given up their pet rocks. I, I think they moved from being an interesting, fun kind of gag to going into a drawer and then into a box in the attic and... Finally, when cleaning out stuff that doesn't matter anymore, it just went to the curb with the garbage. And the concern about viewing God as static and uninvolved, unmoved, is that same kind of concern. If God just kind of sits there like a rock, what, where's the relationship? And so the place of God in 
in my life moves to the drawer, to the corner, to the closet, to the attic, and ultimately out with the garbage, because it doesn't really matter. But instead, what we have in Scripture, we see time and again is God involved in and through our lives. We see that when the time was full, when the time was right, God came in Christ to reconcile the world to himself. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Scripture says. That's, God, that's proof of God's love toward us. God is our rock and our salvation, the psalmist says. God is our rock, solid, firm, secure, a great foundation on which to build our lives, uh, our shelter in the storm our shade in the heat of the day. But God calls us into relationship, a dynamic, living relationship with God and with others, a relationship that brings about wholeness, brings about peace, brings about abundant life, for everyone who is touched by that relationship, is ministered to through that relationship, who is fed and clothed through that relationship, who hears the good news of God's love through that relationship. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our gracious God, our rock and our salvation, enable us to live in living relationship with you, that we might bring abundant life, that you might bring abundant life to us and to others through us. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. When we break the bread together, it is a means of sharing in the body of Christ. And when we give thanks over the cup, it is a means of sharing in the blood of Christ.
Let us pray together the prayer after receiving. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Our hymn of invitation is number 555. As we sing it, we invite to the chancel you who would join our church today. You know, we've been uh, having a United Methodist Information class. Our last session was last Sunday, and the graduates of that class joined our church, and they included Aaron Huckabee, who joined by baptism and vow, Gary and Melody Laughlin, who joined by vow, Heather and Dustin Teams, who joined by transfer and vow, and Christine and Noah Magrita, who joined by vow. And this morning at the earlier service, Dustin Dobbins and Scott Arnold became members of our church family. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.